Hello and thanks for joining us here on Encore. Coming up on today's show. It's the Paris of poets, painters and post-war effervescence. The left bank is forever associated with artists and intellectuals who filled the boulevard cafes here in the French capital in the mid-20th century. Now writer and journalist Agnès Poirier has plunged into that golden age to explain how the spirit of the Rive Gauche lives on here in France on both sides of the River Seine. She's here to tell us more. And yes, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Your new book, Left Bank, takes us to this mythical time and place that is the Saint-Germain and uh, Latin Quarter neighbourhoods of 1940s Paris. You yourself are a Parisian. You grew up here on the right bank, I believe, but not at this time, of course. You're much too young for that. What did the Left Bank represent for you before writing this book? Well, I mean, like, uh, you know, any French student, really, uh, and born in Paris, um, you really need to uh, travel and to live abroad to actually know what, how mythical the left bank is, not only for us, because it's our daily life, you know, going to uh, art house cinemas, just as, as I went as a student uh, at my lunch break, you know, seeing or the films, the history of cinema uh, for the price of a sandwich um, was normal. And then you, and that's just one among many other things you do as a student on the left bank. And, uh, and then you, you travel and you realize that you've been incredibly lucky to live that life. And of course, you know, you are in your 20s when you read Hemingway's A Movable Feast and, uh, and you discover, you know, what an incredible, incredible city it is. Most of the people you refer to in the book, Sartre, Camus, de Beauvoir and Beckett are gone. But some of the institutions that were around at the time are still very much alive and well. The Edition de Minuit Publishing House, for example, some of the cafes cafes and hotels of that neighbourhood, we went down to the Boulevard Saint-Germain to see what people make of it today. It's like a bohemian spirit with uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who'd come here with Sartre and the writers and philosophers. I lived here 29 years ago and I studied French. I think it's just uh, the most iconic part of Paris. It's a little village. <laughs> I've lived here for 25 years and it's changed a lot. It had a lot more of an intellectual spirit, less show off and less expensive. It's more, uh, it's more bourgeois, you know and more rich, uh, it's less fun. It has changed a lot, but it's still, I think, nicer than the right, right side, so. I'm definitely a left bank person. Rive gauche, voilà. No, moi je préfère rive gauche. Right. I prefer right back. I like the right. <laughs> So, and yes, some of those cafes we saw there, that area, they can feel a bit like pieces of cultural heritage. Some people even say that Paris is a ville musée or a museum town, and that's not always a compliment. Do you think that's the case? Well, it is the case and it is not the case. You know, it's like Venice, of course. It's an iconic city. Um, but... Um, you know, what is interesting is that in, for instance, all the writers and artists and philosophers I talk about all lived because of the housing crisis in decrepit old hotels. And all those hotels are, are still here today, and most of them on the left bank are now boutique hotels. But there are a few that are still the same. I booked myself in Hotel La Louisiane, where uh, Sartre and de Beauvoir and Camus uh, lived, especially in the round uh, room. And it's family owned. Um, you can feel that actually, you know, they have uh, some money every year to redo some of the hotel, but uh, the, the spirit of the 1940s still lives on. And actually, it's not um, extravagant in price. And uh, so if you look carefully, you find Paris of the 1940s, but Paris is this place where 
the French Revolution or uh, the impress Impressionist uh, uh, period, the 1880s, uh, the Belle Epoque and the Roaring Twenties and uh, the Left Bank of the 1940s and up to May 68, of course, is very present in the street. You can touch the stone. You know, it's something that is very central. So it's a city where I think nowhere else in the world you have the feeling of history. History is talking to you uh, as you walk through the streets. And of course, there is always some tacky and, and nouveau-ish parts, but it was uh, the same in the uh, uh, 200 years ago. So if you have your eyes wide open, you uh, find the spirit of Paris. Indeed, you mentioned La Louisiane uh, Hotel. We asked the hotel's owner, Xavier Blanchot, about how it continues to inspire artists today. Here in room 36, like room 19 and 10, these are the three round rooms. We call them the literary rooms because they were frequented by numerous writers, philosophers, filmmakers, theater directors and musicians. Lots of famous people such as Quentin Tarantino at the time when he was writing Pulp Fiction, and then the Inglorious Bastards. Also, Robert Lepage, the Canadian director, even Pink Floyd, and notably this is where More was filmed. This was the first film about Ibiza. Now, your book, Left Bank, mentions the growing political consciousness among artists during the Second World War and their commitment to political action. Do you think that's the case for people today? Do they engage with politics in the same way? Well, they do differently. We've got social networks. Uh, the youth, I mean, the thing with the youth, especially after Brexit, because my daily job is also to uh, comment on British politics, it's very interesting because uh, a lot of them, you know, you can say that uh, uh, anyone uh, from the age of 18 to the age of 35 in Britain are overwhelmingly uh, pro European, and yet they didn't bother to go and vote. Um, so, um, uh, you know, at the time, um, in the 1940s, because of the Second World War, because of the, you know, the occupation of Paris, for instance, for um, all the, the French intellectuals who lived there, it had a massive impact on them. And, you know, Beauvoir and, and Sartre are not the same people before the war and after the war. And originally, my book started in 1944 up to 1954. And I, the first day when I started um, writing, I thought I couldn't possibly uh, start in 1944 because the, the, the four previous years completely changed and informed and shaped the persons who they would uh, uh, become. And the same for Norman Mailers and Saul Bellow, because we're talking about French intellectuals. There are so many other people in the book. There's a huge cast. Um, and Richard Wright, uh, James Baldwin. Uh, I wanted to come to that. In fact, the, the cosmopolitan aspect of Paris at the time, uh, it had taken over from other European capitals. And I was interested to read about uh, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, and musician Miles Davis. As black Americans, what do you think drew them to Paris? Oh, it's simple at the time. Um, you know, like Sidney Bechet uh, uh, before them. Uh, they just, Richard Wright says it very uh, simply. You know, he took the boat uh, from New York to uh, Le Havre and then uh, the train through Normandy uh, was quite shocked to see the poverty um, and uh, the effects of the war on, on the country. And he was taken for what he was, a rich American, because Richard Wright is one of the characters who arrive is already very well known in America and uh, three of his books have just been published in France and you know for him it's wonderful it's, it's not black you know anymore it's just uh, um, an American uh, writer and and the same for, for Miles Davis or James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Now Simone de Beauvoir is uh, one of the most striking figures in this book and it's a really good introduction to her work just how radically feminist it was for those who don't know it. You've written extensively on that issue feminism perceptions of women in the UK and in France and a recent article of yours attempted to explain the French attitude from certain high-profile figures when they challenged the Me Too movement uh, in the US. There was an open letter signed by people like Catherine Deneuve. Uh, you said that those women got the tone wrong. Now, could you explain just what is the French tone when it comes to feminism? Oh, well, you know, if we're talking about that letter that Catherine Deneuve signed among 
a hundred other uh, French women. They were, you know, it was, I thought, a very badly edited um, uh, letter, and uh, there was something that really shocked the British and the Americans, and rightly so, um, which was the right to pester women. Uh, of course, men don't have the right to pester women. But if you go, and um, so many things were also lost in translation, but if you go deeper into that letter, um, there are also some very good things and some strong arguments saying that there is, you know, with the Me Too movements, what they are saying is that there is also a sort of cultural revi sorry, revisionism. That is to say, plays are being rewritten. Um, uh, suddenly we're thinking, should we still hang Picasso's paintings because it was awful to uh, the woman in his life? You know, they, what they were trying to do uh, in a very French way, that is to say, quite direct, that can appear as quite blunt, was saying, you know, great things uh, about the Me Too movement, but let us not install a sort of new way of thinking, a correct way of thinking, what George Orwell would have called the thought police. I think they were just trying to um, raise their hand and saying, you know, let's try and be more nuanced. And also, we need men on our side. You know? mm -hmm. It's not a, a question just for women. Now, finally, we asked for your cultural recommendation of the moment, and you directed us to an exhibition here in Paris featuring the work of Franco-Japanese artist Sugiharu Fujita. Now, he was another émigré here in the French capital. What is it about his work that interests you? Well, first of all, Fujita, who was a star in the, uh, the 1920s when arrived, Picasso was in awe of Fujita's art, which uh, he managed, you know, West, meets uh, the Far East and a sort of uh, gothic Japanese um, art, a lot of naked women, but a lot also of cats. Um, and he was the most successful artist of the 1920s in Montparnasse, Montparnasse in Paris, both critically and financially. Agnès Perrier, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll leave you with a glimpse of the Fujita show, which is on at the Musée Mayol here in Paris until mid-July. Do remember to check out our website. You can also keep up with Encore on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. France 24, c'est la richesse de la diversité culturelle mondiale avec un réseau de correspondants à travers la planète. En France 24 en espagnol, communiquons à Latinoamérique avec le monde entier. Rouh mihania, chaharouha wahed, hurriyat et tabir. Hadi hiya, basmat, France 24. Africa on France 24 is about its people and their stories. Los ciudadanos nos cuentan cuáles son las iniciativas y las problemáticas que tienen en sus comunidades a través del programa Los Observadores. Eso los acerca aún más a France 24. 